Thank you all for being here this morning. We have such limited time, I'm going to go ahead and, and see if I can move forward a little bit. In early September, I did a forum on a very brief discussion about some of the history of St. James's. And that was, that was a lot of fun to do. And then I repeated it for the men's Bible study a little bit later in the year. But this morning is not a repeat of that forum, which gave a very broad sweep of the overview of the history of St. James's. Rather, what I want to do today is focus a little bit more on some of the items out of our time capsules that were in our cornerstone and talk about some of the history of those and how they relate to the parish. I want to thank Bobby Garland and, uh, and uh, his company who prepared this box for us. Trying to find a display case was almost impossible. The Science Museum lent us some display cases when we were there with them, but we couldn't couldn't bring them to church. So Bobby had one made for us out of, out of plexiglass and wood, so it'll be nice and sturdy. And I want to thank, where's Matt? Matt Preston over there, who has done all of the research on all of these items, done all the tagging of the items, photographing of the items, and scanning of all the items that were in um, the two time capsules. So I want to take a minute to thank Matt right now for his amazing work. And Matt will be sharing a, f a little bit of what he's learned about some of these items as we move along. Uh, these items will be on display, as Carmen said this morning, until June. June 2nd, we're sticking everything back in the wall. All these wonderful historical items, they're wonderful, perfect to enjoy and to look at, but they're part of who we are and they need to go back where they came from. So we hope to have them a little bit better cared for for the next hundred years. But on June 2nd, we will put them back into the wall in a new box, seal the wall up, and wonder whether they can figure out where it is a hundred years from now. <laughs> Somebody wanted to know if, I was gonna, if we were going to leave them directions to find it. I said, no, no. <laughs> I had to work for it. They have to work for it. No. Um, it should be really fun. So that'll be on June 2nd. We are in the middle of our centennial year. Although we are 175 years old, we have been on Franklin Street for 100 years. And so um, the, the building was dedicated in May. of uh, The cornerstone was laid in May of 1912. And the first service was in June of 1913. So in honor of that first service in our sanctuary, that's when we'll have our centennial service on June 2nd. Uh, let me start by saying that as your rector, I don't usually encourage spending a lot of time looking backwards. As a congregation, it's important to always be moving forward, to looking at where God is calling us to go next, and not to focus too nostalgically on where we've been or what our roots are. But in this centennial year, it seems incredibly appropriate that we spend some time doing this, because we have a rich history, and we can't in some ways know where we're going, without having some understanding of where we've been. So, as many of you know, I went on the search for the time capsule this summer after reading in our parish history that uh, there was one in the cornerstone. So how many people were at the feast? So you saw the, some of the display at the feast. Well, Charlie C. and I, Charlie C. and I, was one of Bobby Garland's um, great workers, we spent um, about a week trying to find it. It was not in the cornerstone, it was underneath the cornerstone, in a little slot carved out of this stone. And the only way we could get to it was from inside the closet in the back of the narthex. Inside of it, here's the original box. This is what was in the wall. Inside of that was this. This is the lead time capsule from the church in 1838, which is heavy as lead. <laughs> this is the copper box that they filled with items in 1912 and then slid the lead box inside of it 
and sealed it up and soldered it and stuck it in the wall. And it's very dirty. It took several days of drilling and digging and careful chipping to get into the brick, behind 18 inches of brick, to get to the time capsule. And you can see where it was in the wall, you can see the corner of it poking out, and you can see how deep it was underneath the brick. Is it too bright in here? Is everybody still able to see? Do I need to close the blinds any? Why don't you all pull the blinds some if we need to? Feel free to. As you can see, I dressed appropriately for the event. <laughs> and uh, we got in there and got the box out. And that's the box when we first removed it from the wall. And here is the video that I shot. Charlie helped us cut into it, and we opened it that afternoon. We didn't unpack it, but we opened it. And this is the video I took with my phone as we did that. August 3rd, 2012, we've gotten the cornerstone box out of the church from underneath the cornerstone. The copper box is the box they laid in 1912. The lead square box is the box from 5th and Marshall Street. We've opened the box, but we're not going to remove any of the contents until we talk to the Virginia Historical Society. But you can see how much they have packed the box from 1912. As well as you can see in 1912, before they put the copper box away, how they opened the box from 1835 in the original cornerstone at 5th and Marshall Street as well as there are old coins. 1798. 1798 coins inside the box. <laughs> and Valerie is here, and Stephen, Charlie, Bobby, Massey, and Randy. 1798, 187. And 1872. This is the inside of the box from 5th and Marshall Street. All we did was remove the lead lid that, that, that had already been cut open in 1912. You can see inside that there's a Holy Bible and some letters. And a silver plaque from the And a cornerstone. silver plaque. Look how shiny it was. The old cornerstone, and interesting enough, no tarnish on the silver black. Believe me, it's tarnished now. <laughs> no oxygen in there all those years kept it so shiny. We unpacked the boxes in front of the vestry, the Valentine Museum, and the Virginia Historical Society a few weeks later. And the items in that little box filled six large tables when we opened them up and spread them out. You remember that piece of paper I said was a letter that was folded up in the top of the box from 1838? You could see it in the video. That is the letter right there, scanned by a mat. And here's what it says. In the name of God, amen. This foundation cornerstone of St. James's Church, once again, notice the S apostrophe S. <laughs> Let there be no doubt. That's 1838. <laughs> is laid the second day of April in the year of our Lord, 1838. The Right Reverend Richard Channing Moore uh, officiating. The Reverend Adam Empey being rector of St. James's Church, John Williams and William Lambert absent, being the wardens, and James Beale, G. Persico, and John C. McCabe, the other vestrymen of the church. May Almighty God smile upon this work here begun and crown it with his blessing. May the friends of this church soon have reason to rejoice at its completion and to unite in thanksgiving to him who is the author of all good. Lord grant this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. That is a really fabulous piece of history for us to have.
As I mentioned during the forum in, Saint, in September, St. James's uh, was founded by a wonderful group of very colorful characters. I think it's really important for us to realize that, that in 1838, the, they were men who were on the vestry in those days. Women were not allowed to serve on the vestry. That the men who were on the vestry came from very all different walks of life and had really interesting histories leading up and following the founding of St. James's. They were not guys who came over with the... Well, don't say the Mayflower, that would be the wrong one. <laughs> with Jamestown. You know, some of them, a couple families had been here a long time. A lot of the families were brand new. They came from all different walks of life, and I love that about the founders of our parish. And I think that's very important as we continue to appreciate and value our own diversity here at St. James's. John Williams, that's John Williams right there, was the senior warden, and many say the driving force behind the founding of St. James's. He really wanted there to be a third Episcopal church in the city, one on the far western edge of the city. Fifth and Marshall Street was the far western edge of the city. He was a merchant and an exporter who had just arrived from Monaghan County, Ireland in 1816. So this is 1838. So he had just emigrated from Ireland in 1816. Dr. James Beale, another member of the vestry, was a local dentist. General William Lambert, member of the vestry, later became mayor of Richmond for quite a long time. From 1840 to 1853, he was mayor of Richmond. Herbert A. Claiborne was a lawyer and later a member of the House of Delegates. John C. McCabe was a great friend. Um, he's, he, uh, John C. McCabe was a great friend of Edgar Allan Poe and a Confederate chaplain during the war. Later became ordained and, became a, and was a Confederate chaplain. Adolph Dill had recently moved from Pennsylvania and was a very, very wealthy baker. Now, how very, very wealthy and baker go together, I'm not sure, but he was a very, very wealthy baker in 1838. And my favorite is Gennaro Persico, who was an artist and a teacher who had recently emigrated in 1820 from Naples, Italy, and was later lost at sea in 1859. This is going to be hard to see this next slide, forgive me. But this was a printed piece of paper in the time capsule that gave the reasons for wanting to build the new church. And my favorite part of it is that it says a large number of people, owing to the want of free seats in some church, and when they say free, they mean that literally, free seats in some church, become, it goes on to say, destitute to the means of moral and religious instruction, are plainly seen in their habits, leaving destitute orphans. <laughs> so one of the reasons they wanted to build the church was for the low moral standards of those who didn't have a place of worship. And pew prices were $120 to $180 for a thousand years. <laughs> That's not a bad deal, is it? <laughs> Our rector at that time, as I said in our history lesson in September, was the Reverend Adam Empey, who was the first chaplain at West Point. He was the founder of St. James's, with another S apostrophe S, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and the president of William and Mary and the rector of Bruton Parish before he came to Richmond. And he was much beloved, so beloved, in fact, that it is said that many, many families gave Empey as the middle name of their children. <laughs> so what am I doing wrong? <laughs> I think Hollerith is a great middle name. West Point, Virginia, or West Point, New York? He was the first chaplain of the military, military academy at West Point. West Point, West Point. This is a copy of um, the actual bulletin used for the blessing of the cornerstone. Okay. 
Yeah, this one over here, sorry, that's misplaced. I meant to say I took that out twice. It keeps coming back. This is the invitation to the blessing, laying of the cornerstone in 1912. And you'll see that again in a minute. But that's the actual service used in 1838. It's dark. The dark spot is where the paper touched the top of the box. The Masons played a huge role in those days, and all of the hymns were Masonic in origin. That's a copy of some of the hymns that was, that's from inside the box that was sung at the laying of the cornerstone, and a piece of Arbor Vitae, which is the, what do I say, Matt, the symbol, the yeah, sacred... The, the tree of life is what it means in Latin. It was a symbol of Masonry at the time. Um, it's actually our common cedar tree, which is different from the cedar of Lebanon, but they may not have known that, actually. So there you go. <laughs> Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt a little bit for do some of the coins that were inside. Um, I'm not going to spend long. We don't have a lot of time. We also have a whole other era to talk about. Um, but just briefly, um, I want to tell you about a few things here. We have, uh, I think these are, these are dimes or half dimes. They actually had half dimes instead of nickels at the time, but they're tiny. Uh, and I you know, did all three of them together. They're all from uh, 1837. Uh, here we have um, half eagle or quarter eagle. I can't remember which photo this That's is. That's the half eagle. That's the half eagle. Um, it's a little bit larger. The quarter eagle is just under that. But uh, the half eagle is, I think, uh, $5 or is it 10 Five dollars gold piece. Yeah. Um, my notes are kind of mixed up at the moment. Um, I want to look at this other one in the corner just a little closer. Um, one of the older coins in the collection and actually one of the most nicely detailed um, you'll see a little bit later on in 1912 how badly some of these things can wear through time, but um, this is a 1798 Drake bust dollar, silver dollar, and it's actually quite rare. Um, when you go into searching coins, I learned a lot about this, having 15 stars on these um, is very rare. You think 13 stars is standard for you know, American symbolism, well for some reason they put 15. Uh, most of them had 13, and on the back there's a small eagle, which was a limited edition way of doing it. At this point, they were figuring out how they wanted to do the coinage and, you know, cast those dies and such. Um, this is the oldest piece identifiable in the collection. Um, you can find this and uh, some of those other coins up here later when you get the chance, but as you see, it's, it's quite fragile. I think Randy was saying it was shoved up in the corner or it may have fallen up in the corner there, but um, it's, uh, if, if you've heard of a continental note, it became, became notorious after, after the Revolutionary War for being worthless. This was the Virginia version of that. Um, and you can see it's number uh, 19,999, kind of a cool number, but uh, passed by act in July 17th, 1775. So it's a nice little gem that somebody decided to contribute. Um, then we have some of these uh, examples of bills of credit issued by banks. Uh, it's kind of like a little um, bond certificate at the bottom. You actually have to pile up a stack of these to redeem them. They're only six and a quarter cents. But you have to have at least five dollars worth to really get any actual money back from the bank. So it's a, a form of small currency from the time. Don't anybody put them in the plate, please. Yeah. <laughs> Real quickly. Um, this is the large version of that. If you notice, what's so fun, wonderful to me is that it is Virginia currency in shillings. Yeah. <laughs> 1775. And it literally was loose in the box, crammed into a corner, all crumpled up. Since 1838. <clears throat> Now we're going to move ahead quite a bit. There's a lot of history in between, but we're just trying to focus on some of the things in the box. So, 1912, the rector at that time was the Reverend Dr. William Meade Big Ears Clark. <laughs> a wonderful man. He became rector in 1896 of St. James's, and uh, was passionate about the place at the time when the church was deteriorating rapidly, both in membership and in condition. 
The church at 5th and Marshall Street was rapidly being surrounded by commerce and stables. And uh, people reported that the smell was driving folks away on Sunday. And so from the mid-1870s to 1912, there was a push to try to get a new church built. And it was William Mead Clark, along with some leadership in the parish, who finally got it done. And that's his actual calling card that was inside the box. Randy, the rectory, 1218, that I grew up in was named for him right across the street. Oh, was it really? That's interesting, Tom. I didn't know that. He was a graduate of UVA and the Virginia Theological Seminary. The church by 1896 was in constant need of repair, and it's said that um, when we helped to host the general convention of the Episcopal Church was held in Richmond in 1907, the general convention of everybody in the country, and St. James has helped to host it, J.P. Morgan put $100 in the collection plate because the church was in such bad shape. <laughs> And a $100 bill in the collection plate in 1907, please, you can put all of those in there you'd like, okay? <laughs> that was quite something. That was quite something in 1907. So after looking at land all over the city, from Belvedere to Grace Street to the Boulevard, they finally settled on our piece of property at Birch and Franklin Street, which was purchased from the College of Richmond, or Richmond College, for $29,000. This is an actual copy that was inside the um, time capsule of the reasons for wanting to leave and build a new church, which was circulated to the entire parish. And it's fascinating, fascinating to read. Unfortunately, we don't have time to read all of it. But it gives the costs, it gives the pew values, it gives how the whole thing will take place and why they wanted to move. Uh, to build the sanctuary, it cost $89,000 in 19... $89,700, and Nolan in Baskerville, who built the Bethahaba, was the architect who built St. James's. In April of 1912, the old time capsule in the lead box was dug up and removed from the um, cornerstone of the church at 5th and Marshall Street. And there was an article in the Times-Dispatch detailing everything that was in that cornerstone. That's the, uh, that's the far ar article on the far right. There are other articles at the time gave the reasons why we wanted to move uptown. And then a very small article that Matt found about reasons why we wanted to sell the church. Or the fact that we did sell the old church to tall harmers. For fifty thousand dollars. The paper has always spelled St. James wrong. <laughs> I mean, literally, always. It's a tradition. It is a tradition. <laughs> and Zach, don't let it change, okay, bud? <laughs> yeah, we've always been. I mean, I guess S apostrophe S was the way to spell in the mid nineteenth century. The way to spell St. James's. And we had just, many churches didn't hold on to it. We, sem we seemed to hold on to it all those years. Invitation to the laying of the cornerstone went out. There's an actual invitation to the laying of the cornerstone in 1912, 3 p.m. The rector and vestry cordially invite you to attend the service of the laying of the cornerstone at St. James Church. Even the invitation didn't have the S apostrophe S. Isn't that interesting? These are some of the letters that uh, Dr. Clark received from people across the country. President of Virginia Seminary sent a letter of congratulations. And then the other letter that's very hard to see is from um, Morehouse, who was the head of the Living Church. And if anyone knows Morehouse Publishing, he was a famous Episcopalian. And uh, the publishing company was named after him. But we have how many letters, Matt? Probably a dozen letters from... Uh, the Catholic bishop in Richmond, from clergy all around the state, offering congratulations, which they put all in the time capsule, which I thought was kind of neat. There's the service for the laying of the cornerstone for May 7th, 1912 at 5 p.m. Dr. Gibson, 
Bishop Gibson was the bishop who presided, who was the father of Churchill Gibson, who was later the rector of St. James's. And George Peterkin, uh, D.D., is the son of the rector who was here during the Civil War, who became Bishop of West Virginia. We had a famous... Uh, um, <laughs> in our history, it says that John Powell, who later became a very well-known Victorian um, writer of liturgical music, became very famous later on, from what we understand, um, wrote a piece for the parish and put it in the time capsule. And we had no idea what it was. So imagine our surprise when we unpack the time capsule and it's called Erotic Poem. <laughs> I'm still trying to talk Mark into Virginia into actually performing the piece on June 2nd. Um, Mark has hummed it. I don't think they've actually played it yet. <laughs> now I'm going to call Matt back up and talk about some of the currency that was in the 1912 time capsule. All right. If you, if you look at this one up here in the corner, I'll talk about that more in a minute, but you can see how much it's degraded, and that's probably mostly just from being used, from being handled before it was put in the box. Uh, but it's an, an amazing collection of things entirely that have been put in there. I'd love to get in the heads of the people who said, I'll put this thing in there. Or, you know, I wonder if they had a lot of things they didn't have room for. Um, but we don't know that, so the best we can do is look at it and figure out what it was. But it really speaks a lot to the culture of the time. Um, we have uh, Bank of Howardsville notes. Um, again, there was a lot of different ways of issuing currency in the time. Um, Again, these are issued by banks. They don't do that anymore. They're issued by the United States government only. But uh, here we have Confederate $20 bill, which is actually worth now more than it was when it was put in the box, uh, because at that time it was, it could not legally be worth anything. Uh, and here we have a picture of Columbus. It's, I think, the first depiction of somebody who's an actual person on a United States coin. It was to commemorate the Columbian Exposition. Um, commemorating the anniversary of Columbus's coming to America and discovering it, as some folks phrase. So here's that penny all washed out. It's actually the same as that uh, silver dollar, the same image I talked to you before, and it's the same date, uh, although you can't see it very well. Um, here's one with the same deal that was also in there. Uh, and of particular note, I want to look at the bottom here. Check this out. They, they didn't issue this one in 1806 because they didn't need to, so they just went ahead and struck it again. And we have 1807. Um, there's lots of really cool things you can find when you look into this kind of stuff. Um, here we have a bond, a $5,000 Confederate bond. Um, again, worth more now than it was when it was put in the box, although, you know, sentimentally, it's... It's a pretty cool relic, and they must have considered it very important when they put in there to t speak about what had happened in their recent history in 1912. Someone purchased it, interestingly, in 1863. Yeah. So there, there wasn't um, a whole lot of positive stuff going on in the Confederacy in 1863. Things were not looking all that great. And to spend $5,000 in that year on a bond was something. Yeah, the economics of the time were cataclysmic for the Confederacy, and they were issuing bond after bond trying to get it to work. Uh, think about Treasury policy this day, how they're trying to manage this complicated thing called the economy, and a lot of last-ditch efforts and zero interest rates and things, same problem. Uh, this is one of the more interesting pieces in there. Um, these were ordered uh, from France, uh, during the last days of the war after Jackson uh, had died. This is uh, Stonewall Jackson, and they ordered these medallions. They're actually quite large, um, right about that big around. Um, there were several hundred of them, of them ordered, and as soon as they got to the United States, came through a blockade, uh, they were lost in a warehouse because of the confusion of the war. I found a few articles about it, but then they were found a few years later. And um, I'm going to leave this article description up here with some of these artifacts if you want to look at it later. But it's 
quite an interesting story. Um, on the back, uh, we have you know a very proud listing of all the battles he was in and some of the major battles of the war. Uh, and it's really a testament to that kind of holding firm and that pride in the South that a lot of people felt um, right up to the end of the war and even afterwards, the fact that they would keep this, that they would put this in there. Uh, we have a different look on the war now, but it's really interesting to see how much they really felt passionate about that lost cause. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'm going to show you a few stamps that they put in there. Um, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis, um, <laughs> and then up there is Pocahontas. So that's a U.S. issue stamp. The others are Confederate, obviously. Um, if you look at Pocahontas here, um, see that it says Jamestown 1607. This was actually issued as part of a series, possibly the first series commemorating something in a U.S. stamp. They were usually pretty generic. Uh, but this one commemorates the uh, exposition at Jamestown. Um, this is a version of the uh, Jefferson Davis stamp. There were several. This was printed in Richmond right before uh, all of the facilities had to be evacuated from Richmond. Um, you see these little grid lines. In fact, judging stamps, you can tell whether they were printed in Richmond or in South Carolina. It's kind of muddier. They just weren't as good as it had it done in South Carolina. Um, this one was printed in London. Uh, again, they had to reach far and wide in order to get stuff done in the Confederacy. Thank you, Matt. If we understand correctly, the most valuable thing we have monetarily is that uh, Stonewall Jackson medallion, because it's so rare. There were only so few of them made. Bunches of newspapers were placed into the time capsule in 1838 and in 1912. We were overwhelmed with newspapers, but one of the most interesting ones is that the sinking of the Titanic happened shortly before the laying of the cornerstone in 1912, and so the Richmond Times-Dispatch detailing several, several days later the sinking of the Titanic was included in the paper. And then um, that's a copy of another Times Dispatch that was placed into the, into the time capsule. Um, there was a major shooting in one of the local courts where a judge had been shot. An inmate grabbed a pistol from one of the uh, deputies in the courtroom and shot a judge. And um, all the papers in there have long and in-depth articles about what happened for, uh, at that time. And I think there was such an exciting sort of event in Richmond that that's why they stuck, shoved, shoved all those papers um, into the time capsule that day. Now, this leads me to talk about what we hope to do for the next hundred years. I can't begin to talk about everything that's in the time capsule, especially given the fact that we have virtually very little time to do it, but over the months between now and June, we will recycle in the display case almost everything that's in the time capsule. Really valuable items, we may have to put photographs of them out. But you have things you can touch over here on this table. Dr. Peterkin's prayer book from the Civil War, um, the Bible and prayer book from, um, that were out, that were included in the time capsule. Lots of things to handle and then other things to look at. But you know, we have been so blessed by, by having these things and being able to enjoy them. And I want us to think about this year as a special opportunity for us to do something to make our own mark on the history of St. James's. On June 2nd, when we put all these things back in the time capsule, we will put new things in the time capsule as well for the next hundred years. But for this year, one thing we want to do is we want to raise a million dollars for our endowment. A million dollars for our endowment, just in this centennial year. This is the first time ever in the history of St. James's we've raised, tried to raise cash gifts for our endowment. Our endowment right now is about $4 million. For a church our size, it should be a minimum of $6 million. And so many people over the, cent over the uh, decades, for many, many years, have left gifts in their will to make our endowment what it is. And that has been very important. Without our endowment, the church might not have been able to rebuild after the fire. We wouldn't have been able to get loans to build this building. And whenever something major breaks in this parish, chillers, boilers, HVA, HC, H, what do you call it? HVC, yeah, air conditioning and heat. 
when they go out, it is our endowment that makes it possible for us to replace those things because they're budget busters. And so for the next hundred years, what we want to make sure is that a hundred years from now, that this place is the same vibrant community it's always been. We stand on the shoulders of so many who have come before. This is the front page of a brochure that everyone will be receiving in the mail, talking about our history and talking about this opportunity to raise some money for our endowment. Now, we're so grateful to all those who have contributed over the years, and you have an opportunity to make a cash gift to the endowment, or if that's not something you're able to do and you'd like to put something in your will, if you'd prefer to do that, that's wonderful as well. End-of-life gifts are the primary way we raise money for our endowment. But um, we want to leave something for a legacy that will continue on long after us. Because as you know, um, religion is changing within Western culture. And the work that's done here over the years, the lives that have been changed, the people that have been touched, the folks who have been fed and housed and cared for, the ministry that has taken place in this building and from this location and from our parish over those 175 years is astonishing and astounding. We have an opportunity to try to make sure that 100 years from now, we still have the resources to be able to have this community doing what it's always done, worshiping God, serving our Lord, caring for one another and the wider community. Kathy McGee and her committee, I'd like to have Kathy to stand up, and the Centennial Committee, where's the Centennial Committee if you're out there? Would you all stand up if you're a member of the committee? We have a lot of folks who have given a lot of time and effort, and they will be um, leading this, this push to try to, to raise a million dollars between now and June. And we're all in different places in our lives, and we understand that. And any gift and every gift is very much valued, and we thank you for that. Now, what I want to do to end with is I'd like to pray the prayer that Dr. Clark wrote, that he asked for the entire parish to pray while they were raising money and building this sanctuary. And I want us to pray it on an ongoing basis for the rest of our time between now and June 2nd. So remember, when you get this bullet brochure, look it over carefully. Take a look at your letter. And if you can, please, please make a gift uh, on the pledge card for our endowment. You know, when we're building buildings like this, as we did it back in 2008, that's a sexy thing to raise money for. Because it's something you get to stand in and enjoy. But make no mistake about it. The money that we have that protects these buildings is so very important. So very important. And of all institutions, churches are famous for having no endowment or very small endowments. So at this one time occasion on our 100th anniversary, I'm excited about us doing this undertaking. And with your help, I know we can reach the point where we raise a million dollars and add it to the four million currently in our endowment. That's a copy of the prayer that was placed in the time capsule. And I want to read it for us today. Pray it for us today. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the foundation of love and source of wisdom, who dost cause all people to be of one mind in a household, look in love and mercy upon this congregation, called in thy providence to plan and build for the future of thy holy church. Fill them with thy spirit of zeal, loyalty, and a sound mind. Touch their hearts with love and liberality. Enlighten their minds with wisdom and sound judgment. Inspire their thoughts by thy Holy Spirit and guide their actions by, their overruling, by thy overruling providence. Make them the instruments of furthering thy cause, glorifying thy name and building up thy kingdom. Remove far from them all that would hinder and divert, and give them unity of spirit and the bond of peace. Make their officers fit leaders and wise counselors, and give them grace to seek only the furthering of righteousness and truth. Prosper thy work of our hands, and fulfill all our desires, we humbly pray, through him who alone can give fruition to all our hopes, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you think that was a long prayer, you should have heard a sermon. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I'm going to pull the table out so we can get all the way around it. Come take a look. <laughs>